All right, let's take a look now at analog I.O. We've talked about discrete I.O. In, in some of the previous videos and kind of how the discrete I.O. gets handled by the PLC. Uh, now we'll look at analog I.O. And if we recall, um, the, you know, the um, discrete, again, was an on or an off or a one or a zero, um, you know, two states only. Um, whereas an analog device is something that we'll consider uh, like a real number or, or an integer value. It has, um, you know, it's going to have a real number to it um, as opposed to just a zero or a one. So an example of that would be in the discrete world, if we wanted to do a temperature switch, then we would have a set point on the temperature switch, say like 100 degrees. And when the temperature reached 100 degrees, then the contact closed and that would be, you know, an on. Whereas a temperature sensor is actually going to give us the real temperature reading of whatever it is you're measuring. So uh, just like the thermometer you put, you know, under your tongue, or if you have the one that, you know, you shoot up against your temple on your head, then it gives you an actual temperature reading, right, of your body temperature. This will be an actual temperature reading of whatever process you're measuring. So that's a real number. And we're going to call that an engineering unit because, um, you know, the temperature has, you know, whatever, it's going to be a Celsius or a Fahrenheit um, degree reading. So that that's, again, uh, an engineering unit, a number that we recognize. We understand what 100 degrees Fahrenheit means. It's hot. Um, we understand what, you know, 20 degrees Fahrenheit is. That's pretty cold. So we understand that. So typical analog sensors, um, would be things like a temperature or a pressure measurement or a flow or a level. There, of course, can be many, many different types of analog sensors out there. Some can detect, um, you know, power, voltage, current. Some can detect humidity. Um, it's not just these four, but these are the four most common uh, in our process space. And we're going to call these inputs, right? Because again, we're measuring temperature, we're measuring pressure, flow, and level, and we're bringing those sensors or those measurements into the PLC. So those will be considered inputs. We can't write a temperature per se, right? You, uh, we can't write a pressure to the sensor. The pressure the sensor is reading the pressure and then sending it to the PLC. Examples of an output would be an analog output would be things like a panel meter or a control valve or electrical heating elements or even the PLCs and, and controllers. Um, so, you know, so basically we, we can, um, in the PLC world, we can have an analog input card reading values and we can also have an analog output card that would send an analog signal out to some device. And we'll, we'll kind of cover that here in just a few moments. So, you know, and this is very relevant, of course, to the instrumentation and controls uh, space that, that everyone is studying. And we talk a lot about, you know, transmitters, two wire transmitters. So the, the transmitter is used to convert again, these, these actual real uh, process measurements and put them into a kind of a universal signal. So an, an, so an analog signal from a transmitter is commonly four to 20 milliamp signal. Uh, there, there is also um, a zero to 10 volt DC uh, transmitter or a zero to five volt DC transmitter. Um, you can also see a zero to 20 milliamp transmitter, but four to 20 milliamp is probably the, uh, the most common commonly used. And what happens is, is, you know, that these transmitters, which basically, um, this is what we call the kind of the hockey puck. Uh, they also have some that are kind of DIN rail mounted devices like this. So what happens is, is you would take in the, um, you know, the signal from the, uh, from the actual, uh, you know, device such as let's go back to temperature again. So we have some, you know, to, to measure temperature, we have to have some kind of a temperature probe, right? So we have a temperature probe that is, um, you know, measuring temperature and putting out some kind of signal. That signal goes into this transmitter and the transmitter reads that signal and converts it 
into a 4 to 20 milliamp um, output, essentially. So that 4 to 20 milliamp output is what we use to go actually into the PLC as an input. Um, and 4 to 20 milliamp kind of came about, you know, quite some time ago, kind of became a standard. Um, and uh, uh, we'll kind of kind of go a, a little bit more on that here in just a moment. But um, it, it kind of is, uh, it kind of came from, you know, truly the old time, old days before electronics and, you know, the kind of the modern electronics came about. They used um, uh, pressurized air systems or pneumatic systems. And those pneumatic systems were kind of key to a certain PSI range, like three to 15 PSI or something. So you can kind of do, so they were able to kind of vary the, uh, you know, control based on the amount of air pressure in the line. So between three and 15 PSI was kind of the standard. So when they converted into the electrical world and the electronics came about, that kind of concept of a three to 15 PSI became a four to 20 milliamp signal. The advantage of a four to 20 milliamp signal is that we can, we can actually transmit that over some distance with little to no loss of signal. So four to 20, 20 milliamp signal became um, kind of the, the, the commonplace. Uh, because again, you know, if you think about a chemical plant, you know, they could be very large, you know, lots of real estate, um, you know, throughout the process. We have to bring these signals back from these devices that are sitting, you know, actually in the process, you know, on the process equipment itself, and you bring it back to a control room. So that, that distance could be um, several hundred, several thousand feet, and maybe even more at times. So, um, so basically, uh, the 4 to 20 milliamp signal gives us the ability to, um, to, to travel greater distance. Um, and, and here's some other examples uh, up here in the bullets too, just to go over, right? So in addition to flow, you can see, see things like speed. You know, if it's an engine, we go get the speed of the engine. Uh, we go get position. So uh, we have an encoder, they call them encoders, that can kind of measure the position, especially if something's like travel, like we have a, a mechanism that makes something kind of travel a certain distance out. We can detect, you know, how far out did it travel? What's that position? Um, level again, temperature, pressure, strain, and uh, pH even. So pH is very important in some chemical processes. So uh, those are some other examples that we could um, possibly see as inputs to our PLC. So the two wire current loop is uh, basically can be thought of as this triangle, um, you know, it's three legs to the, uh, to the loop. Uh, but more commonly, we like to think in the terms of square when we draw little circuit diagrams. We don't usually draw things in a triangle shape, but it's basically three sides to this triangle. And the, the three main pieces to, to kind of create this uh, current loop is the transmitter itself, which is basically the device that is used to transmit the data from the sensor over the two wire current loop. So um, we call it a two wire current loop because it is two wires. It's a twisted shielded pair wire, which means that it's got two wires that are, um, you know, twisted together. So they kind of kind of like a, like a braiding of your, you know, the kind of braiding. So it's two wires that twist, twist about and then it's shielded. I mean, there's a, a shield wire uh, or drain wire in there. And the reason for the twisting and the reason for the shield is to reduce the noise, electrical noise that could get induced on that wire um, throughout the, uh, you know, when you're, when it's traveling from the field into the control room, it's possible that it might get put into a tray, the wire tray that might have some high voltage power lines or some other, you know, wires. So the, the twisted shield of pair um, helps reduce the noise on that wire, electrical noise on that wire. Because we really want to make sure that this signal that, that comes from the transmitter is not degraded or interfered with in any way, because it's very important that we get an accurate reading of the process. Second part is the receiver. So basically, you know, this, the transmitter is putting out the four to 20 milliamp signal. Something has to receive the four to 20 milliamp signal. So um, basically the, the, the receiver, it could be things like a panel meter or it could be an actuator valve. It could be a, a motor speed control, 
or it could even be the PLC's analog input. That is would be considered a receiver of the signal. And the last uh, piece of the uh, of the loop here is the source of the current or the power supply. So we do have to, you know, power this loop. It just doesn't magically have power to it. Uh, it's, this is electronics inside this transmitter. So we do have to, you know, power the loop, as they say. So there's usually some source of current or power um, in the loop itself. So just to kind of give some, uh, you know, some pictures of kind of what these things look like. Again, um, in the instrumentation studies, you might have seen these things. They might have seen some in the lab. But uh, typically, again, if we're looking at industrial kind of process devices, they tend to have this look and feel, um, this blue housing usually. And then, and then inside the blue housing, like this guy right here, inside the blue housing is the electronics that is basically going to to uh, you know interpret the the real engineering unit here and convert it to the 4 to 20 amp signal. Um, some have a uh, little digital displays on front, which can give you a, a, a reading of what's going on right there on the face. Some don't. Um, this uh, this kind of cover here just kind of screws off, and you can have access to the uh, to the electronics from there. You can also see there's kind of a couple of uh, ports that you can actually bring your wires into. So that's where we you know this is where the wires are going out of this device and going to you know back to the um whatever the receiver is going to be uh be it a plc or some other device in this example um this is a flow transmitter so we have some kind of a kind of a pipe going here and we have uh, the flow actually would kind of come in and you can see there's an arrow here indicating the direction of the flow so the direction of the flow does matter as far as the, this uh, transmitter goes. So the flow of the pipe is, looks like it's gonna be going this way through the flow meter and then out and then wherever else into the process. So uh, so as the flow comes through here, there's uh, there's something inside this, uh, this area here that measures that flow and then sends it up here into the electronics part that can convert that flow into the four to 20 milliamp um, output signal. Uh, temperature is definitely one of the probably one of the most common things you know we'll see. So temperature transmitters usually have um, you know the same kind of blue housing especially in our industrial space and they have what's called a thermo well uh, which kind of comes out of the housing. So so we have a, a thermo well here so that so again, if you're thinking of this as like a pipe or a vessel, like a tank, um, you know, there's the thermal well is actually like a uh, kind of like a sleeve that the temperature probe itself goes in. Uh, so kind of here's our our thermal well, and then here's our RTD probe right here that kind of just would go into the thermal well, and that would get it into the actual pipe itself. The advantage of the thermal well basically is that if I had to remove this device and remove this temperature probe. You know, if there's a liquid in this pipe or gas in this pipe, um, that would basically just you know put a big old hole right in the pipe, right? So the thermal well keeps the pipe kind of sealed, and we allows us to kind of put our um, probe in here without actually um, sticking the probe in the actual fluid or gas. So again, just for maintenance purposes, we can take this this piece out, but this piece stays, and uh, we don't have any leakage of whatever is inside that pipe. And then inside the head of this um, this kind of uh, body here, you can see the you know, same thing right here. It are typically these little little hockey puck transmitters, which so it was the black hockey puck in the previous picture, but um, here in the Rosemont version, it's kind of got a blue and white body. But it's the same thing. We're going to basically bring our wires from our probe uh, to the transmitter, and then there'll be a four to twenty milliamp output that the transmitter will put out that we can you know send to our receiver uh, whatever our receiver is going to be level transmitters there are um, a lot of different types of level transmitters out there uh, different technologies different uh, you know styles it kind of depends on you know lots of different factors as to when you would pick one versus the other 
Um, you have some that are, shall we say, intrusive. You have some that are non-intrusive. Um, you know, so it depends on the liquid, perhaps, that you're trying to measure. It depends on, uh, you know, the process, you know, the, if it's hazardous locations or not. Uh, it could also depend possibly on how caustic, you know, the, the, the material, the, the liquid is. You know, if it's really, really um, caustic and will will kind of destroy anything that it touches, um, you know, putting a probe that goes in the liquid may not be a good idea. So they have things like uh, radar gauges instead that will just kind of bounce a, uh, a radar signal or ultrasonic signal off the, off the top of the liquid to, to measure how, maybe how high it is. Um, there are um, kind of probes that just kind of stick in and as the liquid rises, the capacitance, you know, on this probe changes. Um, there's these kind of things like a float. So as the float goes up, it can actually measure and gives out a, 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 a signal as to how high it is too. So, so level gives you lots of different um, options to, uh, to look at here. But in essence, they all work in the same manner in that they, they will measure the level and they will send out a four to 20 milliamp signal based on what that level is. And pressure. Pressure is a, a very common uh, measurement as well. Uh, you know, pressure can be, uh, there are many different units of pressure, PSI, pascals, millibars. Um, but typically the pressure transmitters, they have some kind of a sensing membrane. So this kind of metallic body piece and this kind of threaded piece, this is what would actually get, uh, kind of get connected, in, you know, to the pipe or to the vessel. The, and then whatever the pressure is inside of there is actually going to kind of come up, kind of come up that tube and will press against this membrane that's inside of this uh, pressure transmitter. And by the, by measuring how much that membrane gets kind of uh, um, disrupted, shall we say, or pushed against is going to be how this transmitter, you know, interprets that as an actual PSI number. And then, of course, converts it into a 4 to 20 milliamps, milliamp signal and sends it out to the uh, PLC. So basically, uh, just you know, so when so just like all all these transmitters, uh, when you purchase them, you do have to kind of at least understand what the range is of the you know the process. So, for instance, um, if 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 the pipe that you're going to try to measure a pressure in, you know would have a normal operating pressure of anywhere between, you know, zero and a hundred PSI, um, then you would buy a pressure transmitter that would kind of be within that range, so to speak. You wouldn't buy a pressure transmitter that was like, you know, zero to like 10,000 PSI because, you know, you're never going to use anything over a hundred. So, so every, every transmitter is, uh, comes as options as far as how many, you know, what, what the units are, what the range is of the transmitter. So you try to get a transmitter that's going to be, you know, as close as possible to the, the full range. It could go a little over, of course, the full range, but as close as possible to the full range of whatever it is you're measuring. That way you're going to get the most precision out of that transmitter uh, as possible. So just some examples of the receivers. Uh, or things that would take a four to 20 milliamp signal and then use it or, or, you know, so, uh, the most common, you know, simple is a, just a, a panel meter. So, you know, if you, you could have a, um, a wall of panel meters in a, in a control room and each panel meter is tied back to a temperature transmitter. And basically, so each, each panel meter would be just be displaying, you know, what the actual value of that transmitter is. And these panel meters would be um, scaled in that they would know that again, in the, just in the previous example of that pressure transmitter, if that pressure transmitter was scaled from zero to 100 PSI, and it's putting out a four to 20 milliamp signal based on a range of zero to 100 PSI, then the display would be kind of programmed and are scaled to also match that zero to 100 PSI. So it would know that when it got, you know, a 20 milliamp signal, that would be full, full scale, which would be a hundred PSI. So uh, that's, you just kind of program that, program that in. Um, panel meters come in all different shapes and sizes as well. This is just, you know, nice, simple numeric 
this one's got a nice you know, a little bit of a, uh, a graph in addition to the numeric so this gives you you know the, the, this just gives you a number but this kind of gives you a range of where you are so uh, you know a number may or may not be um, you know you may or may or may or may not understand right off the bat you know what this means but here you understand that oh I'm I'm around half a little bit over half of the full range of whatever it is right so you can see if we're low you can see if we're high but it also gives you the number so we know what the exact number is um, we also have just a, a good old-fashioned analog these are of course digital meters uh, you can do it, uh, an analog value of, of that as well just meaning that it's a needle and the needle will move based on the um, the reading that it gets from the transmitter another type of receiver is an actuator or control valves so um, in the process space the control valve is is very common so what happens now is you know this control valve has a motor up here and it has a, a converter here that would take the 4 to 20 milliamp signal and it will um, basically open the valve based on whatever the the 4 to 20 milliamp signal coming to it is so for instance if it's at the top 20 milliamps then most likely that would mean that the valve would be 100% open because that's 100% of the transmitter. Uh, if it's 4 milliamps, which is 0% of the transmitter, then that would probably mean that the valve is full closed. If it was receiving 12 milliamps, which is about halfway between 4 and 20, that would be 50%. That would mean that the valve would be about 50% open. So essentially, based on whatever the analog 4 to 20 milliamp signal that we give this valve, this valve will open to that kind of percentage, and that will allow us to really control the flow uh, that comes through this valve. And that's very, very important, and it's going to be very uh, common, uh, especially in again in the industrial, especially uh, you know process chemical type uh, control applications. Kind of another version of that is our linear actuator. So in this case. It's not a valve, you know, the valve here opens. This is just a, uh, a, a kind of like a rod, an actuator that would come out. So we can actually, you know, send this rod out, you know, 100%, 50%, 25%, right? So we can control maybe how much we're, we're moving something right now. And, and, and you know, so we're, if we're going to, we want to mechanically move something uh, in the process, um, we would do that with these actuators. So actuators would probably not be um, that common in a chemical processing environment. That would be something probably more common in a manufacturing environment, like um, you know, like a factory assembly line uh, type of situation, more so than chemical process process applications. All right, and uh, one other kind of key thing to the transmitters. Is that there are actually a few different types of connections, and we we kind of we call them um, by the number of wires. So there's a two wire uh, trans. There's kind of a two wire uh, transmitter, a three wire transmitter, and a four wire transmitter. Now don't get this confused with the the actual cable that the 40 20 milliamp signal is going on. That is a two wire. Um, uh, connection that's a twisted shielded pair connection what we mean here now by two wire three wire four wire is kind of how many actual connection points do we have to each transmitter so a two wire transmitter is kind of the example we showed earlier where we have a transmitter the power source is in series with the loop and the receiver is in series right so there's only so here's a transmitter there's only two connections to the transmitter right and in and out so that's why we call that a two wire system in our three wire system uh three wire transmitter we have the in and the out of the current but we also have a a third connection for the power so we actually will give this transmitter a separate power source and we won't put the power source inside the loop shall we say of this uh, transmitter uh, this is probably not as common. Uh, you will see two wire and the last one, four wire, probably most commonly. And I would 
venture guess at the four wire transmitter, it's probably going to be maybe the even more common of them all. But a four wire transmitter is simply uh, we're going to bring power to the transmitter separately. So we have our say this is a 24 volt power supply. So we have a plus and a minus 24 volts feeding the trans, you know, kind of powering the transmitter. And then our current just kind of comes out of the transmitter and goes to the receiver in this loop. And there's no power source inside the loop. So it's really just, it's good to know. You're going to hear this terminology. You're going to hear two wire. You're going to hear four wire transmitter. Just good to kind of understand what the, uh, what those two actually mean. And it is a current. So 4 to 20 milliamp current. So um, if you're not that familiar with some of the uh, basic circuits analysis, um, we put our current devices in series with each other. So we can have more than one receiver in this loop. This is shown as like kind of like one receiver. So this could be like, you know, like one panel meter or going to the analog input card of the PLC. But we could actually put, uh, you know, a panel meter and connect the signal to the PLC. But to do that, we have to do, we have to put those in series with each other. So we would have the uh, receiver one in series and then put receiver two in series. We can't put those in parallel. Those currents, um, currents in parallel uh, would divide and that would uh, not be good. We don't want to divide our current because now we're, we're not reading an accurate value from the transmitter. So we need to make sure all of our currents are in a, in, you know, wired in series with each other um, in, in one of these loops. There is, of course, a limit to how many devices you can put in a loop. You, you can't, you know, so there, you would have to um, kind of look at what they call the burden. Uh, so, you know, there will be a, a kind of a specification. So you do have to kind of be careful to not overburden your transmitter by putting, you know, too many receivers in your loop. Uh, I think last piece here might be the uh, the heart, and it's just to, to to know that um, one of the things that's really common, especially in the again in the chemical processing and oil and gas processing space, is the heart uh, protocol, and heart stands for highway addressable remote transducer. And what happens now is on the same four to twenty milliamp signal wire that we're using to go from the transmitter back to the PLC. Um, in addition to the 4 to 20 milliamp signal, there's also a, a a kind of a communication protocol that gets superimposed uh, on top of that 4 to 20 milliamp signal, which basically means that we have smarter transmitters now. So, you know, in the previous, you know, we just had the simple loop. All the, all we know is from the receiver's end is that it's a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, and that's all we know. And uh, but with heart. Uh, and if we have a heart transmitter, a smart heart transmitter and a, and a smart heart capable receiver, then in addition to the 4 to 20 milliamp signal, we can also get a lot of data, a lot of diagnostics, a lot of information out of the transmitter in addition, which is very important because we can now kind of, you know, get, uh, you know, again, get diagnostics. We can know if the, if the transmitter has got some uh, faults to it. It just helps us with our troubleshooting. And in some cases, we can actually write back to the transmitter and, and send some uh, configuration data down. If we need to change something, we don't have to necessarily go out to the field to change it. We could do it um, back in the control room and send the signal out over heart. Um, so there is a, uh, there's a heart communicator, which allows you to kind of tap on and, and also configure the, uh, the sensor and kind of read things. So this also helps with troubleshooting because you can just put this thing on the, uh, you know, in, in the loop and, and get some diagnostics like a, as a little handheld troubleshooter. They call that the heart communicator. Okay, switching gears briefly, you know, in the uh, discrete, in the, in the discrete videos, we made sure to highlight that there was a ISA uh, symbol for each device, like a push button, limit switch, right? All the various devices had their own unique um, kind of symbols. When we come to the process space, 
we don't, or to the analog uh, device space like that, we don't necessarily have a maybe a, a, a symbol per se that says I'm a temperature versus a, a pressure. Instead, we have what's called the PNID uh, symbols or the process and instrumentation diagram symbols. So a PNID diagram is going to be, you know, uh, oh, I should say piping. I, I might have misspoke there, but the piping and instrumentation diagram. So the so being that everything we, we were talking about there, temperature, pro, level, process, uh, sorry, flow, um, pressure, those are all things that are you know out in the in the in the process plant floor, and they're usually tied to piping of some sort, right? Because which think about an oil refinery, you know, we're moving, you know, we're, we're moving oil through pipes into the cracker unit and then it gets processed and then it comes out as gasoline. We're going to move the gasoline through pipes to some other, you know, piece of the process perhaps. So, you know, we have piping throughout the process. So it's important to have a diagram and have some symbols that represent you know, the mechanical pieces, which will be the piping and the valves. And then of course the electrical pieces, which are all the transmitters, um, and maybe control elements that are out there. So we use a P and ID diagram to show that aspect. It'll actually show both the mechanical systems, piping vessels like tanks and whatnot, as well as electrical, um, you know, symbols like, uh, again, instrumentation and electrical devices that are all working together to control the process. So when you look at a piping uh, PID diagram, uh, a solid line will indicate that it's a pipe. A solid line with the little two hash marks indicate that it's an instrument air line. So like a, you know, a, a pneumatic line, you know, pressurized air. Um, a solid line with little kind of L's will indicate it's a hydraulic line. So if you're, you know, having a fluid, hydraulic fluid of some sort to control something. And then um, for, for us, electric, we are looking at um, dashed line to represent that it's an electric connection, electrical uh, connection. Other things we see are the valves, right? So the valves are these little kind of... Um, little two triangles or a little bow tie looking thing. That's our valve. And the valve will have different uh, little symbols on it to indicate what type of valve it is. So like a T would mean it's just a, a, a hand operated gate valve, you know, the good old fashioned, you gotta go out there and, and uh, rotate the, um, the, you know, rotate the handle to open and close the valve, kind of just like you do with your hose um, in your, at your house. Um, there's a, Control valves will, you know, if, if it's a control valve, like, you know, we, like we saw where we can actually control the value, then they'll have this kind of little symbol with a half circle on top. If it's a solenoid valve, which was, we discussed back in the discrete section, that's kind of, you know, an on or off only, then you'll get a, a square with the S. We showed that symbol back there. And then if it's a motor operated valve, um, we will have a M in that square. All right. But for us in the instrumentation, uh, the you know, for us, for the instrumentation devices that we're going to be interested in, uh, the electrical stuff, basically, these are the symbols that we'll see on the PID diagram. If we see a circle, then that's going to be a, dis a discrete instrument. Uh, and they use the term discrete here, but that, that basically means like a single instrument. Um, it, it is an analog device still. Um, so... So we'll use that as a, you know, if it's a transmitter or um, a pressure switch or some other device. If we see this kind of hexagon shape, that's a computer system. Uh, if we see a kind of a diamond with a square around it, uh, that's usually a PLC. Uh, could be the, the term it's a PLC or a safety instrumented system. And then if it's a circle with a square around it, then it's kind of a, uh, a basic uh, process control system. Um, so you can see these different symbols. So we're really, we're really going to be looking for things like that to, to point us back to our instrument instrumentation devices. 
And the other kind of piece here is to know that, you know, inside the circle will be some, some letters and numbers. Uh, typically, the letters indicate kind of what the function of the device is, be it a temperature, flow, level. So it'd be like a T, an F, an L, or a P for pressure. And then the number is usually indicates the device number itself. So every device will be coded, like, you know, you know, temperature transmitter number, you know, 123. So that's a unique number for that transmitter. Um, if there's no line, then the instrument is mounted in the field near the process. So basically, this is it right out in the field on the unit. If there's a, a kind of a line going across, then it's a instrument mounted in the control room. And if they put this dashed line across, then it's kind of, it's out of sight and it's going to be something that's not accessible to an operator. So these two are accessible to the operator. This is out in the field. This is in the control room. And this means that it's um, probably inside the unit or inside the piece of equipment and you can't get to it on, under normal conditions. So this chart gives you some, uh, just some basic, um, you know, kind of what, what some of these symbols might be. I will tell you that this is probably where they don't really have a good standard. So you could see some different um, nomenclature, shall we say, on some P&ID drawings that you might might see um, at your future uh, places of work. But in general, like we said, the first the first letter will indicate at least kind of what it you know what it is being that if it's temperature is a t or a p for pressure or l for level or um f for flow the second letter typically will tell you kind of what it's uh what it's what its function is or what its capability is so for instance an i would be an indicator that means that's that's nothing more than just a temperature indicator. It's it's giving you the temperature reading. A T would be a transmitter, so a temperature transmitter. So that would be the device that is putting out a four to twenty milliamp signal. Uh, an R would be a recorder, so that that's kind of an older terminology, but you you could have like a chart recorder. C would be a controller, so you have a temperature controller. Um, so that if you saw an S, that could be a switch. So a TS would be a temperature switch. A TT would be a temperature transmitter. So that's how we can read these things. Um, and uh, just kind of just give you some additional examples of some different um, nomenclature here. So again, so PI for pressure indicator, FC for flow controller, um, right? And LT for level transmitter. So those would be very common things to look for. So here is what a PID drawing could look like. So we have some kind of uh, vessel of some sort. Uh, this is labeled as T100. We don't necessarily know what this is. We just know that it's some sort of vessel. Uh, but we do have some instrumentation symbols here, right? So we have an LS and an HH and like an LT. And then we have an LT with this the square around it and an LY. And we can see we got a valve symbol here. We got another circle with an LV, and we see a, a, a dashed line here, which tells us that that's an electrical connection. And we see a dashed line here, electrical, electrical. Then we see solid lines, which basically mean piping, right? So we can start to kind of figure out what's going on in this drawing just just from looking at a few, you know, kind of starting to look at this and put a few pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so we know L stands for level, and we know S stands for switch. And the HH would indicate that it's a high. And it typically means, HH typically means high, high. So there could be two levels of like high, right? You could have a high and you could have a high, high. Meaning that, okay, I've got basically like a this, you know, high is like, you know, kind of your first level of like, okay, things are getting bad. And high, high would mean, okay, we're really at the upper limit of what we can do here. Um, so more, so the high, high is a more severe, um, alarm to worry about perhaps um we have uh over here lt and we know that again l is level and t is a transmitter so basically this instrument here is looking at the level of the vessel or the tank and it's a transmitter and therefore it's putting out this electrical 4 to 20 milliamp signal 
back to this LT. Now this is drawn with the square run, and so that was telling us this was a this was a bit of a, a controller of some sort. So even though it still says LT and it says L LT101, and this was LT101, the symbol is different. So we know that this is the transmitter and this is the controller. Uh, and then we have an LY and L for level again. Y, um, if we go back a slide, Y could mean um, a relay or a compute uh, device. Um, again, this is where things may not totally be universal at times. Um, so I would kind of imply this to be a um, some sort of level um, kind of control device that will now control this control valve. So we see we have our our hashed lines here, which gives us that it's a uh, uh, an air instrument air. So this device here is going to control this control valve using instrument air. So basically, whatever the level is, whatever the, the controller tells it, it's going to say, "Hey, adjust the adjust the openness of this valve based on this level," and uh, it makes the connection there. Uh, this symbol here is a pump, and P dash 101 is the pump name. So we pretty much know that we're pumping. Um, looks like we're pumping out of the tank, and we can control the flow of that liquid out of the tank based on this control valve right here. So we're probably trying to, you know, somewhat wonder and worry about, you know, the level of the tank and we can control it based on the level, this level transmitter connected to this control valve. So I got a few other examples in here. I'm not going to quite break them down in detail, but you can start to see, you know, similar uh, similar things. We got the LC for a level controller now. We got LT for the level transmitter. We have the um, PT for pressure transmitter and a PC for pressure controller and a PV for uh, pressure valve. So basically we can measure the pressure and we can control the uh, this valve to determine you know if we need to kind of bleed off some pressure or not. Um, we also have another level transmitter level controller. So we have a kind of a water outlet and an oil outlet, and we can con control the levels of all these things based on the transmitters and the controllers tied to these control valves. Another example, and basically the, you know, the uh, P&ID di diagrams can start to get much more complex in those last two examples. So here we start to see more pieces of the unit or the process involved, we've got more, um, we've got more uh, kind of, um, you know, devices out there and, and more um, vessels out there and more piping out there. And then they can continue to get even, you know, more and more involved and even to, um, you know, uh, an entire, uh, kind of an entire unit trying to show on one diagram. So, even though this looks like a very busy drawing and you might be looking at that and really kind of lost, you can start to, you know, by understanding just what those symbols mean and, you know, the piping lines, you can start to make some heads and tails out of this drawing just by, you know, um, looking at what the instrumentation devices are, what are they kind of tied to the control, and you can start to make some, um, you know, some educated, um, you know, some educated assumptions as to what is really happening out there in the process. And, you know, again, from a technician standpoint, you know, you would need the set of drawings to help you troubleshoot a problem. You know, you wouldn't even know where to begin, but with, with the set of drawings like this in a P&ID diagram, you would know that if, you know, if you're looking for whatever is controlling, you know, this piece of the process, well, here's the instruments, right, that are kind of tied to it. You wouldn't start over here with this instrument you would start over here with these instruments, right? So this helps you uh, kind of bring you into the into the right area, right ballpark from the beginning. All right, so that's it for analog devices. Um, we'll uh, pick up in the next video on kind of how does the PLC handle that analog signal when it when it gets received in the analog input card.